It was kind of luck then that you got the TV career you've got. You, you weren't meant to be in. They saw you. So that's just down to personality, isn't it? Then somebody somewhere thought that you were great at what you did. You came across in a good way on camera. That's a lot of luck, isn't it? Yeah, hell of a lot of luck. You're a bit like Jay McDonald on the cruise, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Me and Jane, got a lot in common. Now, now I make telly and understand it, I think that um, I can see why I was picked up now because basically in three minutes I'd express quite a quick recipe very clearly um, as well as being busy in the frenetics of a busy restaurant you know and I think you know the lessons to be learnt there is like you know it's quite easy to do a cooking recipe to camera and for it to go on for hours and then once you edit it it's still hours long you know so I can kind of see now why they picked up on it I mean actual fact it went out on the night when I was working as well so I never saw it and the next day the phone started ringing but they were largely from internal calls taking the mickey pretending to be the BBC and stuff and then about <laughs> one o'clock that day the calls really did start from real people from I think it was Granada in those days I think the Beeb was in there and there was a couple of independents in there as well so I had four people phone me up that day and I told them all to shove their own head up their backsides and I was more than rude because I thought <laughs> I thought it was my mates at work and I'll never forget and I spoke to, I spoke to a guy called Stephen Serby um, who worked for Optimum Television in those days I think he's at BBC Bristol now um, and he was being all lovely and polite and I told him to shove it and uh, he mentioned the word commission and pilot and then, and then I realised that I'd make a grave mistake and I <laughs> <laughs> I continued to grovel and apologise. But, um, yeah, it all happened pretty quick. I mean, I, by the time I was 23, we had a best-selling book and a TV show that was getting, you know, four to five and a half million viewers uh, on BBC Two. Yeah, Gordon Bennett. You know, it was mental. And how have you managed to keep your feet on the ground? I think it's so admirable that you don't do the lads' mags and all that rubbish and be seen kicked out of pubs on your backside. Is it because in those days in the beginning you were too busy to be showbiz? I think my, my work effort has never changed since uh, whether I was on telly or not. I've always worked the same sort of hours, 18 hours a day, worked as hard. I don't know, really. I think, you know, I've got good friends and family. I'd like to think I'm unreasonably predictable, possibly even a bit well-behaved. I could probably do with being a bit less well behaved really but most importantly you know I think you know what I've tried to build up over 10 years is trust really and and I have no, I have n there's nothing sexy about doing anything apart from important fair work really so that's kind of why things like Jamie's Kitchen with 15 and school dinners and Ministry of Food I think you know then they, they were never intended you know at points in time I felt they were important to express and I still stand by that now and going back to the school days, how did you feel knowing that suddenly you'd become the star and you'd created something, regardless of how big that was, you were successful? Mm. No, I, mean, I, think, um, I think when you get out into the big wide world, <laughs> relentlessness is what's required to go beyond your wildest dream. And I, and I truly believe, you know, I know there's people that don't like me and, then, and I know there's people that do like me because in a funny way, my relationship through books, I think books is quite an interesting one, like... To flog a book's quite hard, I think. I think it's a tough industry. And to for people to pick it up and trust it is something to be, you know, worth protecting, I think. And really importantly, being honest and a good person, I think, has been the sort of cornerstone of what I've tried to do for 10 years, really, because in my game there's a lot of horrible, horrible people. And I've seen them build up and become amazing based on being quite rough and horrible. And actually, when it comes to coming down those people aren't there to catch you and I think you know that it's never it's never one person that does great stuff and I can honestly say like all the great things that I've ever done have I could never have done on my own I've got an office and a gang of people that work as relentlessly and for for me but also for for things they feel are important really I think I'm in good company you know I think that's the key working with good people you know that's just absolutely I, I think I try and I try and think quite long term as well I mean I think, you know, things like, I mean, think about school dinners. I mean, I knew it would take, and I said on the programme, it would take 13 years to fix it. And I think that's still about right. And we're reasonably on track, but I mean, we could be doing better. But we're, we're pretty much on track. But it's just funny, isn't it, really? I mean, I, I, um, I think it's good times, really. Um, but um, still freaky. I'm only just starting to pinch myself, actually, 10 years down the line. 
I'll tell you when I realised you'd made it, and this might seem nothing to you, but I was over in New York last November, and there you were on David Letterman, yeah. making him laugh and doing your shtick with his shtick. And it was just so funny and original, and it really took me back to those original days of what you did on BBC Two, which was the refreshing something new Jamie Oliver. How does it feel for you when you're being flown out there to appear nationally in America? Because they love you. Well, it's a massive compliment. You know, I think the, the bigger compliment is... Basically, whenever I'm in New York, I can go on the show. I've been on there nine times now, um, which is basically once a year for the last nine years. I mean, we talk to each other like friends now rather than guests, host and presenter or whatever. And it's the same for Jay Leno and the same for Oprah and, and Martha. And I think, you know, what they don't want is someone that's duff and can't express on telly. So, you know, I go there, I do my job, I try and do it really, really well and uh, we hope for the best. And they, you know, they kind of quite like the British lingo and stuff. But you know, my heart, heart's here in Great Britain, really. I mean, I mean, I mean, deeply passion, passionate and um, patriotic. I am. I think we've got a great country here. So that's kind of, you know, the fact that I love it is is partly the reason why I've always done these slightly controversial programmes that don't necessarily please everyone. You know, you just got to do your job, really. Jamie Oliver, I want to talk to you just about the TV thing again, especially when you're live or doing an Oprah or something like that. She's a big fan of yours. I saw that programme on like, Diva TV or something, and it's probably the most watched programme in America, and certainly if you're on there, you've made it. How do you deal with the fact that so many people are watching and it's so high profile and it's as big as you can get? Try not to think about it, really. In the early days, I used to get nervous like everyone else and throw up and myself and everything um, but after a while of doing that you get fed up with it and I did I used to throw up all the time through nerves butterflies I did it for about a year if I, actually if you look at all my original appearances every presenter will say he's feeling a bit under the weather th this morning but he's here anyway Jamie Oliver and um, it was just like I would got so fed up with being nervous um, to the point now where I don't care actually the only person that's made me nervous in 10 years is Oprah you know, because she's just operating on a different level. I mean, she's an incredible bird. An I mean, incredible bird? Yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> she's just, she's amazing. And, she's bigger uh, than the president of America, let's be honest. Oh, God, yeah, definitely. I spent eight weeks of her last year, and I just think that, you know, sometimes, like, there's people that just work on a different level, and I think that often it's hard to relate as a normal person to someone on that level I just think she's interesting because she don't have to do what she has to do she could you know she could have retired 30 years ago but you know she kind of feels like you know she's happy to retire when someone's going to replace her with the same values you know and I think um, yeah I found my time with her utterly inspiring and in the same way that you're doing now with the Ministry of Food, if she says something, people take it seriously and they'll do it. It's a great place to be, isn't it, when people care? Because there aren't many people in show business who people give a toss about their opinion. I just think look, life is short. Often it's hard to read anything outside of your own world, you know. And I think, you know, every now and again it's quite nice to think big and think about, you know, because, you know, Oprah undoubtedly has made positive ch change to sort of America you know and she's got lots of things against her and I think you know and I try and do the same things with my telly although I don't have the reach you know or equivalent reach to what she has but undoubtedly there's a core group of people that are very very um, loyal to, to this, the work that I do I just think the fact that everyone can count is really important and actually you know in school dinners it, it was the masses that made that government find that money it wasn't just me you know, it was a team effort. So, you know, hopefully, um, I don't know. I mean, it's not like I've got a box, a bo load of boxes to tick off. I mean, I have nothing planned ever again. You know, and certainly my family and friends and work colleagues do not want me to do another campaign, movement or documentary ever again. Why? Because it's a horror show. You know, it's hard, hard work. It's a pain in the backside. But the thing is, when I get the idea, I'll do it. You know, when we did school dinners, the whole office shut down and became involved to, as central office of school dinners. Everyone, everyone, from the accountants to HR to the reception, we were all involved in school dinners, you know, and they had no choice because I was the boss. You know, like, guys, this is what we're doing. And, and now, they, I mean, it must be like working for a lunatic. It must really be. But, you know, when we pulled it off, you've, I've never felt such a... Uh, adrenaline and, and sense of achievement from you know every member of my staff felt like they contributed 
And that's pretty mega, isn't it? Yeah, I've got nothing planned for the future, um, and, and certainly there's no impetus from any of my colleagues <laughs> to get involved in anything. But when it comes, it comes, and you can't help it. I just want to talk to you about your critics, because with this Ministry of Food project, which you've got on the TV, and of course you brought out the book, um, you've had some sneery people saying that it's worthy and that you're ranting and raving and that you're belittling people. How personally do you take that type of criticism? The, the thing is, right, my voice and the kind of ripple effect that it creates actually sometimes mutates into things that I never said or did. So, you know, everyone introduced me as the healthy chef right well i'm not i hate the word healthy i think that is worthy i've never certainly mentioned it ever but what i do is about proper food real food i'm not anti-fast food or junk food i just think that there's you know everything in moderation so i think actually if if most people knew me properly i truly think that the stuff that i do is relevant and and uh, can tap into lots of people's sensibilities. Um, but the thing is, obviously, once it's been passed down um, the Chinese whispers a couple of times, you know, people think that I am worthy, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. You know, I don't do these things for, like, critical acclaim. Everything that I've ever done that's actually gone well um, could have equally gone bonkers wrong. They're never a pleasure to make. It's not an easy ride, you know. So I don't know. I just sort of, I just go with my heart, really, mate. I certainly don't care, care what anyone else thinks. You know, it's nice when it works. But, I mean, I think if you listen to everyone else on the periphery, then it confuses you. And I'm deeply paranoid about not being fair. And I think that's a good and rightful paranoia to have. But I think you have to be single-minded about stuff. You know, I mean, honestly, when I did 15 and set that up with all of my life savings at that point, my own father, my business advisor, friends told me not to do it, you know, so I had to be pretty strong to do it anyway, or arrogant, I'm not sure. Probably a bit of both. Maybe I'll have a nice quiet 40s to 60s. You'll see me on an <laughs> island somewhere, sipping on gin and juice. And having watched the school programmes, I mean, it does go over into your private life, and that's such a brave thing to do, because you don't need to do it. Congratulations on that. And also the new baby. How do you feel about that? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. But I've got, I got a great wife, you know, I mean... Um, she puts up with a lot but also I need her I need her to approve in what I'm doing I need her to be in support of what I'm doing if she didn't support me I wouldn't do them and I think and I you know look I'm biased I know but I think the world's a better place for me doing them or, or could be a better place one day what I do will amount to something eventually that is a positive important part of like British food culture but I mean like she's great She's very patient. Yeah, she could do with a little pat on the back as well, actually. I might, I was going to say give her one tonight. <laughs> I can't say that. Well, feel yeah, free. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've already done enough of that. It got me in trouble again last time. Any more of them, or is this the final baby? Would you like 12 babies or something? Listen, when you are a walking, sort of sexual, testosterone-driven, love-making machine, you can't... I'm only human. I can't... I cannot... I cannot box myself in just to one bunk up. I I am relentless in the effort that I put in to producing multiple. I mean, you've got a lot to give and you should give it. That's what I'm thinking. You know, maybe yeah. 30 or 40 children. Who? Anyone? Anyone? Um, listen, I, forgive me. I'm talking rubbish. Um, I I've done know. it for 35 minutes. Why yeah. should we stop now? Um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, at the end of the day, my wife controls the birth control in the house um, and um, you don't get involved with that at all look I am merely a source of um, of the seed and uh, you know well, you're uh, the man's man if the seed can't be planted then it won't be allowed to be any, get anywhere near the mud if you know what I mean mm. yeah these analogies I'm losing the will to live I think it's been a long day it's thank you day. Jamie really thanks for talking to us because uh, you're a top man and your intentions are so honourable that's so nice and good luck with this new book The Ministry of Food your intentions are so good that you care about people yeah yeah, well, I, I think I'm very lucky. I think, you know, there's, it's never ever light or shade, it's always both. You know, I think you just got to crack on and be positive, really. Congratulations on being you. I'm going to let you go now because you must go and make some more babies. Jamie Oliver, <laughs> thanks for talking to me. Thank you very much.